Brian here at Safe Kids Worldwide. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started with today's webinar. Um, so appreciate everybody taking the time to join today. Um, this is a topic that we're very excited about, and clearly, you know, many folks in the network are very excited about. Um, so we feel like this is going to be a really great, informative session, and happy for you to to be here. Uh, before we dive into today's presentation, I'm just going to do a couple of uh, high-level notes for you. Um, first of all, we will have time for questions and answers at the end of the webinar. Um, you can type in a question at any time into the question box, and we'll get to it at the end. Um, there's going to be a few polls in today's webinar, so um, just fair warning to stay sharp. Um, those will we'll give you uh, a notice once those pop up, but we'll ask you a few questions and um, just want to get your input to help inform today's presentation. Um, for those who are certified health education specialists, um, we will have one CHES credit available um, for you for completing this webinar. So just hang till the end and we'll have a, um, a survey that pops up right as the webinar ends to get your feedback. And um, just go ahead and complete that and we'll get you that, that CHES credit. Um, so with that said, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and before we hear from our main presenter today, I'm just going to give a little bit of a uh, background to set the stage. So we all know that preventable injuries are the number one killer of kids. It's not even close. Um, more kids die from these than the next three um, kinds of deaths combined. So it's an issue that's all, it's very close to all of our hearts. Um, it's, it's, it's ingrained in our work and uh, it's, it's really important to understand the ins and outs of this and how we can really strategically work to reduce this number. And that brings us to drowning and water safety. Um, this is an issue that's obviously on our radar. You guys know that um, we've done a couple of research reports in the past couple of years. Um, the most recent uh, coming out earlier this year. Um, one of the things that we found is Sorry, slides are stuck there. Um, that there's been a spike um, recently in the number of deaths per year. Um, and not only in deaths, but morbidity as well. Many kids um, surviving these incidents, but you know, being, being seriously hurt by them and going to the, the hospital. So it's an issue that um, is obviously on our radar for that reason and on the radar of many coalitions. And one really key point here is that there is a a clear disparity um, between white and black children um, in regards to drowning. Um, this is a stat from our 2016 report. Kids the, between the ages of 5 and 17 drowning at nearly five times the rate. So black kids drowning at nearly the five times the rate of, as white kids. Um, and this is a, a, a serious concern for us. And this is a serious concern for today's speaker. Um, Ebony Roseman, she's the founder of Black Kids Swim, and they work to address this disparity head on by empowering um, black children to learn to swim and to get excited about swimming and, and even join swim teams. So we're very happy to have her here today, Today, very thankful to have her, her expertise here, and she's going to talk to us today um, about her organization. She's the founder of Black Kids Swim. Um, what they do, and you know how you guys can begin implementing this work um, at the local level. So with that said, uh, Ebony, please take it away. Thank you, Mark, and I'm so thankful to Safe Kids Worldwide for having Black Kids Swim here today. And um, it's a pleasure to, I guess, electronically meet all of the wonderful people in your network, so thanks. I want to jump right in um, with the three goals that I have for today. We're going to walk through our standard educational outreach presentation that Black Kids Swim gives. So that's one goal that I'll walk you through this presentation. The second is along the way, I'll be giving you tips on how to customize this presentation for your target audiences, because you know them best. And then finally, along the way, I will be providing strategies and concrete steps to help you attract more African Americans to your programs and events. 
uh, the purpose of this, go back, <laughs> thanks. The purpose of this presentation um, is twofold. One, when you're talking to parents of children who cannot swim, you'll be encouraging those parents to enroll their child in a water safety or learn to swim class. And the second is, of course, parents of children who can swim. And our goal with them is to increase their excitement about the sport of competitive swimming and provide information and motivational resources to help them get onto swim teams. And our target audience is usually the, the parents and grandparents of black kids and potential partners or places where you can give this presentation would be anywhere in your community. So Boy Scout and Girl Scout meetings, Back to school nights are great for or those, those final PTA meetings before summer because kids uh, start swimming in the summer. Church groups, YMCAs, youth organizations, uh, black Greek organizations. So you have Delta Sigma Theta, Omega Sci Fi, and all of the organizations in the Panhellenic Council. Uh, specifically, Sigma Gamma Rho has a program called Swim 1922 where they partner with USA Swimming and that's great. Um, you could also partner with National Council of Negro Women and USA Swimming. So this slide is a way to encourage a discussion among your attendees about why people do or do not swim. And we like to ask uh, individuals to self-identify themselves into one of these three categories. And then let them talk for a little bit about why they can't or won't swim and why they do swim. An example that I hear a lot is a person won't swim because one of their family members drowned. And of course, first you would empathize with that person, but then you also want to emphasize that drowning is preventable with education and swim classes. Because the earth is made up of mostly water, so avoiding the water is not a sustainable strategy, but learning to swim is. And you'll also find that the children of parents who can't swim also can't swim. And this is the cycle that we want to break. So as Mark mentioned um, at the beginning, the statistics for the African-American community and having swim skills and drowning rates are frightening. We know that black people can swim. We know that anyone can swim. But the truth is that black people don't swim. And that's what we want to change as black kids swim. If we don't learn how to swim, then we'll continue to drown at high rates. And in the United States, 10 people drown every day. So we're losing black children in the water, and um, we, we really want to change this. Next slide. So here I want to take a moment to ask you all a question. What is the number one way to predict whether or not a child will learn to swim? I'm going to read a, a portion from an op-ed from the Washington Post from about a year ago. Stereotypes suggest black people don't want to swim because they can't float, are scared of water, and will do anything to avoid getting their hair wet. These widely held negative stereotypes are literally killing us. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, black children drown at 5.5 times the rate of other children. And in the United States, where 10 people drown every day, that is a lot of black lives lost. So um, thank you all for voting. We'll leave the poll open for a couple more seconds. But it looks like uh, most of you uh, picked parent swimming ability, um, just, just under uh, two thirds. And then socioeconomic status being in second with about 20%. So you're, you're absolutely right. If a parent can't swim, there's only a 13% chance that a child in their household will learn to swim. And that was from a study by USA Swimming and the University of Memphis. So, and, and the open water drowning statistics um, that were gathered by Safe Kids Worldwide are equally as frightening. And because African Americans as a community lack swim skills, we are grossly underrepresented in aquatic sports, and this includes competitive swimming. The sport of swimming has historically not been very welcoming to African Americans, and as a result, the community does not consider swimming when deciding on sports. Traditional sports for the African American community are track, basketball, football, 
but it is not lack of ability um, that keeps us out of competitive swimming. It is simply lack of access and exposure. We created the Black Kids Swim website, the, our YouTube channel, and our social media accounts to serve as a resource for people just like you, educators and aquatics programmers, health professionals, trying to reach out to recruit African Americans. So please feel free to use this presentation and any of the videos that we're gonna show you today. Ready for the, um, we're, the first video we're going to show target parents and grandparents of black children. And this is to get them excited about registering their child for a summer swim team. And again, all these videos So, sorry guys, we're gonna, okay. <laughs> we're gonna switch over um, to another video. Which one were you? This, that is the one, okay. Summer Swim promo. Mm So again, that short video was targeted towards parents and grandparents to assuage their fears that their child is going to be the only one in the pool or the only one on the team. We're trying to show uh, the country that there is a growing number of black children in the sport and that it can be fun for them too. They can make friends and they can feel welcome and at home. So the second video we're going to do is called Training Day and that is geared towards the actual kids. Um, swimming just doesn't seem cool yet to, to the African-American child community. And so we're doing our best to make swimming cool. Um, we, there's a lot of very exciting swimmers, Medi Matella in France, and of course, Reese Whitley and Cullen Jones here in the US, but they need to see kids their age excelling in the sport. So that's what training day is all about.
Okay. Again, all of these videos and additional ones, including um, in-depth interviews with parents of elite black swimmers, are all available on the YouTube channel, and they're free, open to the public. Feel free to use them to encourage uh, more black kids to get into the pool. So there is a lot of work to be done to make the pool a welcoming place for African Americans. Um, at the start of integration, public pools were filled with cement and closed rather than integrate. African Americans were attacked for trying to swim on public beaches. Acid was poured over children who tried to swim in public pools. And the people who survived these incidents are still alive. They are the grandparents of the children you are trying to recruit to your program. So this is the legacy that you have to overcome if you, when you're trying to get children into your pool. There's fear of the water, there's fear of an unwelcome en environment. Um, today, nearly 60 years after the abolishment of Jim Crow laws that kept African Americans from pools and safe swimming places, many children still never get the chance to swim. Municipalities often favor cheap splash parks over pools in black neighborhoods, and no one learns how to avoid drowning in a splash park. If you have someone in your family or community who drowned because lack of access to swim instruction or safe places to swim, then it's normal that you would be afraid of the water and want to protect your children from drowning. But avoiding the water will not keep your child safe. Only learning how to swim will. So if you, when these slides uh, come up in your community meetings, feel free to allow the attendees to share their stories, express their fears, and then encourage them towards the understanding that it's only learning how to swim that's really going to protect you and your kids. So this brings us to the birth of Black Kids Swim. We've summarized the frightening statistics. We have recognized the impact of racial segregation on the Black community's relationship to swimming. And that brings us to our creation story, the current state of affairs the drowning, the underrepresentation in aquatic sports requires a targeted intervention, and that is the work of Black Kids Swim. Um, we Googled the phrase Black Kids Swim back in 2014 when our daughter, who's a, a very successful competitive swimmer, was the only one at several meets in a row. And what Google's search results returned was just a horrifying list of news stories of black children drowning. So when you Googled Black Kids Swim before we were founded, you saw something very different than what you see today. I encourage you to Google the phrase Black Kids Swim now and see what, what pops up in your return. Uh, this is another opportunity during the presentation to engage with your community to learn about them and to correct negative stereotypes and misperceptions while again giving that positive reinforcing message of the importance of learning how to swim. One thing I hear from adults is, you know, I've tried, I just can't float. And my retort, the retort of other Black Kids Swim volunteers is always, well, maybe you just haven't learned to float properly yet. You know, everybody can float. And um, when is the last time you've taken a swim lesson? Again, I can't stress it enough, this slide is about positive reinforcement, emphasizing that the African American community holds a special place in the world of aquatics. There is a researcher uh, by the name of Kevin Dawson who wrote an article, Enslaved Swimmers and Divers in the Atlantic World. And one quote from his amazing uh, paper is, West Africans often grew up along riverbanks, near lakes, or close to the ocean. In those waterways, many became proficient swimmers, incorporating this skill into their work and recreation. From the age of discovery up through the 19th century, the swimming and underwater diving abilities of, African, of people of African descent often surpassed those of Europeans and their descendants. Indeed, most whites, including sailors, probably could not swim. To reduce drowning deaths, some philanthropists advocated that sailors and others learn to swim. So when slavery began in the United States, black people knew how to swim, and they also used that skill to escape. And this led slave owners to prevent blacks from swimming by making swimming a punishable offense. But historically and around the world, Africans and people of 
color are excellent swimmers and divers. And this is a message that we reinforce a lot to let people know that this is something that is a part of your legacy and that there's a special place for you in the world of swimming and aquatics. So the, the 2010 study completed by USA Swimming and the University of Memphis found that there were several specific things keeping black people out of the pool. Fear on the part of the child swimmer or their parent, not letting them even go swimming or take swimming lessons. Lack of swimming ability, a physical appearance, which is basically referring to hair issues. Lack of parental influence or encouragement lack of black role models in the sport, and finally access to facilities. So these are the issues that we address head on and that we encourage people like you to address as well. If fear is an issue, then let's talk about it. Let's overcome that. If hair and skin issues is an issue, then let's teach people how to care for their children's hair when they're swimming on a regular basis. If there's no role models, then let's push those positive images of black competitive swimmers. And besides, swimming is amazing with countless benefits. It's a lifetime sport. You all, you all know this. <laughs> I'll say it because I know we say it in the, uh, in the presentation. You know, when running and weightlifting is too hard on the body, you can still continue to swim. You can swim up until the day before you give birth. It's, it's a wonderful exercise. There's a lot of job opportunities that are available. Of course, lifeguard and swim instructor, but also aquatic professionals. Um, of course, student athletes, opportunities for scholarship, and then just having a great time in the water. Hair is one of the number one issues that we get questions about through email and through the website. So we have devoted a lot of our website articles. Uh, we've interviewed cosmetologists, um, black hair experts, and black female swimmers to get a better understanding of their hair care regimen. So I could literally talk about this for two hours, but I won't. It's all on the website. So when giving this presentation, it is essential to have someone or some information on site so that people can register right then. And I say that because it's not enough to give parents and grandparents a pamphlet about, well, these are the class offerings this semester or this year or this summer. It should be more about, we have classes this Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. And wouldn't you like to sign up and sign your son up for these classes? Um, and literally let them register right then and there. Okay, another quick question. What is the number one reason people give for not taking a swim class outside of fear? Fear is always the number one, but outside of that, what's the next one? And this is another opportunity for people to, uh, to sign up. This is where you as a subject matter expert in your area can talk about all of the pools and resources that are in your city. All right, so we've got the, the poll up, guys. We'll leave it up. Uh for a few more seconds here, um, and then we'll, we'll share the answers uh, with you this time on the screen. Uh, we also give the that same statistic, children with parents who don't know how to swim are 80% likely to never learn to swim. Okay. Do you have the results? Yes, yeah, so we've got uh, over half uh, answering uh, no knowledge of when and where lessons take place. Um, and 33% with registration fees. So surprise, we have found that many parents don't register because they don't have the time. It's because of their busy work and school schedule. So when you are planning your courses, talk to people in the African American community and find out when is the convenient time. Consider offering classes at times that are convenient to your target community. The other reason that we hear very frequently is that, well, I tried to register, but the classes are always full. So that's, again, just knowing, getting to know your community, when they want to take the classes and where. The Black Kids Swim community is growing. We have um, Giles Smith, who we actually interviewed 
he did a one-on-one -on -one interview with him and then another one with his parents um and that's on the youtube channel he's a member of the u.s national swim team and it's literally his full-time job to swim even though he's never been in the olympics a lot of kids don't know that those opportunities are out there ariana vanderpool wallace is from the bahamas and she's a national record hold, national record holder who has represented the Bahamas in several international championships, including the Olympics. Aaliyah Atkinson is from Jamaica. She's the first black woman to win a world swimming title. She set the world record in the 100 meter breaststroke in Doha. Justin Lynch is currently in college. He's at the University of California in Berkeley. And his claim to fame is that he's broken several records held by Michael Phelps. Now, as you try to get the kids in your community excited about swimming, there's a lot of things you can do. You can take them to diversity meets. There is the Black History Invitational Swim Meet that takes place in February in Washington, D.C. every year. There's the National Black Heritage Championship Swim Meet, which take, takes place over Memorial Day weekend in Cary, North Carolina every year. And when kids see a pool full of kids that look just like them, swimming and having fun and making friends, just a light bulb goes off and something changes that can never be switched back. Um, internationally, there's the Caribbean Island Swimming Championships, which is hosted by the Central American and Caribbean Amateur Swimming Confederation. It's important that black children know about these swimmers because seeing successful black swimmers may inspire them to try the sport. Here we have another question. How many swim classes, and when I say classes, I mean the full course, so maybe like a three-week class where they're coming two to three times a week. How many swim courses does it take for a child to be able to swim 25 meters unassisted? And the reason, the reason why I ask that 25 meters unassisted is because that is usually the minimum qualification to get onto a summer swim team or a year-round swim team. Treading water or doing the elementary backstroke <laughs> is not enough. They really want to see a child be able to make it confidently across the pool 25 meters. So we'll leave the poll up for another couple seconds um, before we close it out there. Okay, and as you guys see, uh, most nearly half answered four. Um, not too far behind was three. And you're right. You're absolutely right. I, I can't speak for all aquatics programs and curriculums. Um, where I live in Prince George's County, Maryland, I think they use the Red Cross curriculum with the bobbers, floaters, strokers one, and strokers two courses. That's four courses before a child can swim across the pool. That's four times a parent has had to pay registration fees. Four times a parent has had to cart their child back and forth to the pool before they can even swim. So that is why we are staunch uh, advocates for children being on a swim team, because one summer on a swim team, your child should know at least two, if not all four strokes by the end of that summer. Plus, they've made a whole new batch of friends. Uh, next step. So uh, Mark said that it would be very helpful if I gave some very specific uh, strategies for increasing attendance in your aquatic programs. I would say partnering with organizations like churches, schools, um, NAACP chapters, the Greek organizations that I mentioned before, including um, Eastern Star or Masons, National Council of Negro Women, um, partnering with them and saying, um, we want to come to one of your meetings and give this presentation is excellent. And if you can find an African-American lifeguard swim coach, um, an actual competitive swimmer, even if they just swim for their high school or summer team, and taking that person with you really changes the tone of the conversation. Um, and I would say jointly give the presentation to the group. Always have swim lesson information and registration aids on hand. You can also reach out to USA Swimming and request one of their Make a Splash events. That's when they bring a famous Olympian to a local pool, they give maybe a half hour swim lesson or or water engagement, I should say, and 
it's important that if you do make a splash event, make sure you have on hand, as always, registration information. Um, taking children in your community to diversity swim meets. And if you have the, the financial and human resources, starting a summer swim league in your community is very powerful. Um, just even if you just have three teams that do a couple dual meets during the summer, it really changes uh, children's relationship to the sport. That's it. This is how you can find us. Follow us on all of our social media feeds. Um, check out our website, and we're, we're always happy to answer any questions or provide any resources that can help get more of our kids in the pool. Well, thank you, um, Ebony, for that presentation, and uh, it's enlightening, you know, to, to see how um, these social and historical aspects really intersect um, with injury, and you, you guys may have seen that this is something we've um, started touching on more here. Um, you know, there's, you're going up against a lot um, with some of the programs that you're working in. And, you know, there's a lot to be aware of and factors to be aware of as to um, why some of these injury numbers are spiking. So that was a really enlightening presentation and um, appreciate it. One more video. Oh, yeah. Um, we do have one more video we're going to show. Um, Ebony, do you want to give a little background on this? Sure. Before? This video was created with some clips from one of the diversity meets that I talked about. It was the 32nd annual Black History Invitational Swim Meet in Washington, D.C. Okay, so we're back, um, and we have some time for for questions. Um, so as I'd mentioned earlier, um, you can go ahead and type any questions you have um, in the question box, and we'll go ahead and answer those now. Um, I think we've got a couple already here, but just keep them coming while um, we're answering questions. So the first uh, question here is from David. Um, and he asks, in your class, do people ask you this, and how do you respond? Are there patterns on where black children drown, like residential pools, apartment pools, natural bodies of water? Um, I would have to turn to the research on that, and I think that Safe Kids Worldwide, most recent study, the May 2018 study, gives us some good data on where they're drowning and at what age and gender they're drowning. Um, in open water. Outside of that, the CDC statistics just say drowning, and I'm not sure if it's pools, oceans, lakes, or what have you. I tend to focus on the number of kids who drowned, and their gender and age, to stress that it's important for that population to learn how to swim because we're losing them. And uh, David, I can check and see if there's any more details after this. Um webinar and uh, email you separately. Okay, um, next question is from Sarah. Uh, what recommendations do you have for growing our aquatic staff so we can better serve the community of youth in need of instruction? It seems to be getting harder and harder to attract instructors, instructors, especially instructors of color. I would like to hear what your recruiting efforts have been so far, uh, where you're recruiting and at what age you're starting. Um, the majority of lifeguards 
in our community grew up swimming. And so it was a na it was a very natural transition and a very easy transition to take the lifeguard training and then start to work and still be around their friends because they're literally on lifeguard duty while their while their former swim team friends are still practicing. Um, so if you if you want to enter another question, Sarah, that that gives us some idea of what your recruiting efforts have been. Um, of course, you can start um, in any of the organizations that I mentioned. All Black Greek organizations have a component for children, where they're encouraging children in community service excellence and academic excellence. So if you would go to one of their meetings and say, like, um, Deltas have the Del Teens, um, Zetas have something, I can't remember what it is, but let their parents know that you're looking to recruit ch uh, teenagers to get lifeguard instruction or swim instruction training that might be another way. Okay, um, next question is from Kelly. Uh, what is the name of the event in Cary, North Carolina? It's the National Black Heritage Championship Swim Meet. And we have a huge article on it on our on our website. Um, yeah, you, go ahead. I was just saying, um, Kelly, you can uh, check out their website uh, for more info on that as well. Um, next question, can we share um, Black Kids Swim motivational videos to engage the community? And I just wanted to add to that. Um, that question was from Miriam. Thank you, Miriam. Um, I just wanted to add, is are the um, attendees free to use like these slides and things like that um, in, their, in their community? The videos, yes. The slides will be able to be downloaded from our website in the next week. So yes, but just not yet on the slides, and yes, right now for the videos. Awesome. Um, next question is from Renee in Georgia. Is the PowerPoint and videos on the website? I believe we just uh, the videos just are on the YouTube that. channel. Yeah, so there's um, YouTube links, uh, Renee. I'm going to send those around um, afterward for all the videos that um, you saw today. And also, if you look at our Facebook and Instagram feeds, there's even more videos there. Awesome. Okay. Um, Linda asks, what type of outreach are you doing to get in this community? I know that there are lots of minority communities that have never heard of this program. Uh, is there funding for kids to take swim classes? We offer scholarships for kids to be on summer swim teams. Um, we have not offered scholarships for kids to take swim lessons yet. One thing we do regularly is share via social media when the YMCA or the Red Cross is offering free swim classes. There's so many um, wonderful philanthropic organizations that fund free swim classes um, that we feel like just amplifying those messages is, is helpful. And in terms of funding, through a partnership with um, American Pools and Guard for Life, we're able to offer this summer some kids to be on summer swim teams. What type of outreach are you doing? So the outreach that we do is things like this, um, a lot of social media, our website, um, emails, and then doing this very presentation to, in, to any community that requests it. You can always email info at Black Kids Swim if you want some help giving the presentation, and then as I said, you'll be able to download, download the slides from our website in the next week. Okay, um, thank you, Ebony. Another follow-up question from Linda. Can you put us on a mailing list um, for these events so that we can get these out in the community? So is there anywhere they can sign up for that? Absolutely, on our website, um, usually there's a pop-up. If not, if you go to the contact page, you should be able to enter in your email address and you'll be added to the, the email list and you'll hear about everything. Okay. I think that's Sarah's follow-up question. Yes. So Sarah, um, we had a question earlier from Sarah and she just followed up. Um, great suggestion to start with developing the swimmers and feeding into employment that way as they get older. Also appreciate the suggestion of taking talking with the sororities and fraternities. Sorry, guys. 
We have typically focused our recruitment efforts on social media, website, job posts, and word of mouth. Yeah, the, um, if, if there are any historically black colleges and universities in your community, they are great as well. Um, parents are always looking for things for their kids to do during the summer, free things for their kids to do during the summer. And they typically start at the local universities um, to see what sort of career enhancing, you know, academic enrichment activities they have. And universities and Greek organizations are really big on this because, of course, they want all kids to go to college. Um, what else did I say? And Boy Scout and Girl Scouts are also great places because Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts stress the importance of learning how to swim as well. Um, Renee just added that the Salvation Army Croc Centers do outreach to low-income African-American families for affordable swim classes. Okay, um, another question from Sarah. What is the time period of application for scholarships for summer swim teams? Um, are they available for the summer still? No, we've closed it. Um, and you'll you'll find that article on the website as well, announcing the winners. Um, so that usually opens up in May and then closes, it's open for about a month because summer swimming starts in mid-June. Okay, um, Paula shared um, something that she's doing. We are piloting a program in Naples um, with the local high school football team. 40% of the athletes don't know how to swim. They come to the pool every Friday to take swimming lessons and do workouts in the pool. The response has been wonderful from the coaches and players. That's a really, really cool idea. Paula, that's amazing. Um, I hope that you reach out to us and send us an email on that because we, I would love for someone to write a story on that for the website. There's this amazing photo of Muhammad Ali training underwater, and he accredited credited a lot of his success to the fact that he did underwater training. And, and now these kids are doing it too. That's just awesome. Thanks for sharing. Thanks, Paula. Um, next question from Michelle. I may have missed this, but do you have an actual swim school or just work with other local groups and programs? Um, side note, I grew up in PG County. That's Prince George's County, Maryland. Um, I now have an organization in Charleston, South Carolina but have lots of contacts there and would love to help share this great work. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. We don't have a swim school. We are education and outreach. So we connect the kids with the pools and with the training. Um, that's what we do. Okay. Um, I think we had maybe one more question that I missed. Um, we got a few more minutes, guys, so keep the questions um, coming. One thing I do want to note is uh, we did we did record this session, um, so we'll be sending that around as part of the follow up um, afterward. But um, do encourage you to reach out to Ebony. Um, she's made her contact information available. Um, I'm going to send that information as well in that follow up email. Um, but please do uh, do take advantage of that. Um, I don't think we have any other questions that have come in. Um, Ebony, do you have any sort of final notes or anything, any final comments um, from your end? Again, thank you to Safe Kids Worldwide for this opportunity to reach out to your network and share um, this information. I really do hope that it's helpful. Thank you for sharing, uh, everyone who's, who's posted questions and comments, for sharing some of the things that have worked for you. Um, I will definitely take this back. Uh, to our community and, and see if we can help some kids with it as well. I would just encourage you to continue doing what you're doing. It's really important. Uh, the statistics are real and we don't want to continue unnecessarily losing our kids. So anything that we can do to be of help, don't hesitate to reach out. Info at blackkidsum.com. Please check out the website, check out our social media and YouTube and use everything freely. It's for, it's there for you. It's there for the kids. I uh, just want to encourage that again. Um, I've also put um, Emily and I's information up here if you have any um, follow-up questions uh, coming our way. Um, but really, please do um, visit the Black Kids Swim website and, and check all that stuff out. And please um, 
you know, take Ebony's uh, advice and, and wisdom to heart in, in your communities. Um, it sounds like there's a lot of great ideas um, on this webinar, and I um, hope, you know, you guys got a lot out of it. So um, before we go, I just want to thank you, Ebony, again, for um, taking the time to come to the office and, and talk to everybody about this. Um, this has been amazing for me, and I'm guessing for many people um, on this webinar. Um, before we close, I would mentioned earlier that we're going to do a um, survey after the webinar. So when the webinar closes out, um, it'll pop up on your screen. It's very short. I think it's four questions. Um, if you could please um, complete that. Um, and that is, again, if you're a certified health education specialist, um, you can get one CEU credit. Um, we will be putting this recording up on the Resource Center so you can access it again um, if, you, if you need to, if you missed anything. Um, but hope you all enjoyed it. Um, thank you for taking the time today, and I uh, hope this was helpful to you. So with that said, um, have a good rest of the day.